this video, we're going to look at the history of the World Federalist Movement, or WFM. Today, WFM is a network of dozens of organizations in many countries of the world, all working to promote the idea of global democracy and world federation. Now, these ideas existed long before the creation of WFM. As far back as the mid-19th century, peace movements started to develop the idea that the best way to stop war was to create a legal structure, above states, through which they could solve their differences through non-violent means. Instead of going to war, they could go to court. And many in the peace movement realised that if world law was going to become a reality, then it would require a world parliament to make this law, and a world government to enforce it. And thus, in the early part of the 20th century, many of these peace movements started to also call for world government and world federation. However, at that time, peace was not to be, and in 1914, the First World War broke out. Afterwards, states came together and formed the League of Nations and the International Court of Justice, hoping that this would be sufficient to keep the peace. Many in the peace movement were convinced that this weak confederation of nations, with no ability to make world law and no real enforcement power, would not keep the peace for long. And so, throughout the 1920s and the 1930s, a growing number of activists and thinkers began to publish books calling for a world federation. And in the late 1930s, as the winds of war were beginning to rumble yet again in Europe, a number of organisations dedicated to promoting an inclusive world federation with a democratic federal world government began to form. One of the first was the Campaign for World Government, founded in the US in 1937 by feminist peace activists Rosica Schwimmer and Lola Maverick Lloyd. The following year, Federal Union was formed in the UK, and separate organisations with the same name were also founded in America and in New Zealand. World Federalist groups were also formed in several Scandinavian countries, and in the late 1930s they organised the first inter-Nordic meeting on World Federation in Sweden. And after the Second World War started, more and more organisations were formed, calling for World Federation. In 1940, the Mouvement Populaire Suisse en faveur d'une fédération des peuples was formed in Switzerland, and the World Federalists were established in the US. In 1942, 15-year-old Harris Wofford set up the Student Federalists, again in the US. In 1946, In Verden, meaning One World, was formed in Denmark, and other World Federalist organisations were set up in Canada, Ireland, France, Australia, Southern Africa, India and Argentina, and others. When the Second World War finally came to an end in 1945, there was a huge surge of interest in the idea of World Federation. The shock of the scale of death and destruction in the war, and the creation of the atomic bomb and its deadly use against Japan, made many people think that another world war simply could not take place. And thus the question of how to organise the world so that countries could sort out their differences in a non-violent manner was very high on the agenda, both among politicians and among the ordinary public. In 1945, shortly after the bombing of Hiroshima, the University of Chicago in America had set up a committee to frame a world constitution, including leading professors from across the social sciences. They felt that it was imperative to act quickly to make sure that war could never happen again. They were very much against the United Nations, which had just been formed, and which they saw as just another powerless league, really like the League of Nations. They thought that it was impossible to reform the UN into a real federation, because the basic structure was all wrong. Instead, they thought that a totally new form of world order was needed, and they thought that between them, they had the intellectual strength and leadership to lead the way. And thus they sat down and started working on drafting a world constitution for a future federal world government. And in 1947, on the other side of the Atlantic, British Labour Party MP Henry Usborne set up the All-Party Parliamentary Group on World Government, which at its peak had around 200 members from the House of Commons and the House of Lords. These statesmen felt the very real need to create a higher power above the states that would settle disagreements between them by non-violent methods and thus avoid another war. So this was a really real and serious issue at this time. In 1947, several World Federation activists decided the time was right 
to bring together the various World Federation organizations so that they could work together in a concerted effort to really bring about a World Federation and a world government in the next few years. They decided to organize a conference which would take place in Montreux in Switzerland. The British Federal Union took the lead in organizing and sent out invitations to the hundred or so world federalist organizations that they knew of, mainly in Europe and America, inviting them to come to Montreux and join forces. And in August that year, 51 organizations and many, many independent delegates indeed came together in Switzerland at the Montreux Congress. All in all, there were about 300 people from 14 countries, and about half of them were students. Messages of support were sent from a variety of important people, including Britain's Foreign Minister Ernest Bevin, Italian Foreign Minister Carlos Sforza, and of course, Albert Einstein. This was the Congress that founded the World Movement for World Federal Government, that would later change its name to the World Association of World Federalists, and then again to the World Federalist Movement, or WFM. It also founded a student movement, the World Student Federalists. The discussions at the Montreux Congress were energetic and intense. The two key questions which dominated the discussions were what should the future world government look like and how do we make it happen? There were two major views about what the future world government should look like. Most of the American delegates favoured a minimalist approach in which the powers of the federal level of world government would be limited only to security issues while most of the European delegates preferred a maximalist approach in which the federal level of government would also deal with socio-economic issues. The Americans wanted to focus on security, while the Europeans also wanted to deal with justice. There was also a divide in views about how best to get there. The Americans favored a gradual and incrementalist approach of reforming the United Nations. The UN was still very new then, and there was a charter reform conference scheduled for 1955, and the Americans favoured drawing up proposals and lobbying politicians in order to achieve change which would lead the UN in the direction of becoming a world government. Most of the Europeans, on the other hand, thought that the UN was fundamentally the wrong organisation, and that instead a new world government had to be created from scratch. They suggested holding a world constitutional convention to draft a world constitution, which they believed could be drafted, amended and ratified within a few years so that the new world government would be in place by 1955. Another group believed that the best route to a world federation was through the formation of regional federations. They thus felt that it was important to devote energy to the fledgling unification process that was beginning to start in Europe, and to push for the creation of a European federation. And so they set up the Union of European Federalists. Regarding the world federation, the speeches on each side were long and detailed, and if they got too theoretical, the student delegates would urge them to a conclusion by chanting, action, action, we want action. That was the energy of the meeting, a desire for action and a belief that World Federation was a possible achievement in the next few years. By the end of the Congress, it was agreed that the world movement for federal world government would pursue both strategies, UN Charter reform and a World Constitutional Convention. A declaration was drafted, what would come to be known as the Montreux Declaration, the founding charter of the World Federalist Movement. Its key paragraphs say, We World Federalists, meeting in Montreux at the first International Congress of the World Movement for World Federal Government, call upon the peoples of the world to join us in our work. We are convinced that mankind cannot survive another world conflict. The second attempt to preserve peace by means of a world organisation, the United Nations, is powerless as at present constituted, to stop the drift of war. We World Federalists are convinced that the establishment of a World Federal Government is the crucial problem of our time. Until it is solved, all other issues, whether national or international, will remain unsettled. It is not between free enterprise and planned economy, nor between capitalism and communism that the choice lies, but between federalism and power politics. Federalism alone can assure the survival of man. We world federalists affirm that mankind can free itself forever from war only through the establishment of a world federal government. And such a federation must be based on the following principles. 1. Universal membership. 2. Limitation of national sovereignty. 3. Enforcement of world law directly on the individual, whoever or wherever he may be, and guarantee the rights of man. 
Four, creation of supranational armed forces capable of guaranteeing the security of the world federal government and of its member states and disarmament of all member nations. Five, ownership and control by the world federal government of atomic development and of other scientific discoveries capable of mass destruction. And six, power to raise adequate revenues directly and independently of state taxes. Now in the following years, most world federalist activists rallied around the idea of a World People's Convention to draft a world constitution. British MP Henry Usborne led the way. In 1948, he set up the Crusade for World Government and turned his Westminster office into its unofficial headquarters. His parliamentary group met there once a week, and young people from the student movement for world government often came by to volunteer and help out. He drew up a detailed plan for a People's Convention, which he said would be held in Geneva in 1950. His plan included a methodology for how delegates would be elected from each country according to the population of that country, with one delegate per million people. So since the UK had a population of 38 million people at the time, he proposed that they would elect 38 delegates. And he made plans for an unofficial election to be held, modelled on the peace ballot of 1934, when activists had organised an unofficial vote to gauge if there was support for the UK to remain in the League of Nations. Usborne thought that if he could get a quarter of the British population to vote for world government, then he would have sufficient popular support to make ratifying the world constitution an issue in the next parliamentary elections. He and his colleagues travelled around the country, explaining the vision and winning considerable support from peace societies, churches, industry groups, trade unions and political parties. He also went on a tour of the US to try and build up support there. While the United World Federalists, the largest World Federalist group in the US, favoured UN reform over the World People's Convention approach, other more radical groups supported him, including the Campaign for World Government, World Republic, the Chicago Committee, the student groups, and so on. He organised a conference in Pennsylvania where participants discussed the pros and cons of his idea and tried to work out the method by which the US would elect delegates to the People's Convention. One of the lead activists in America who supported a People's Convention was historian and classics professor Stringfellow Barr. He suggested that it was important to include people from a wide range of countries in the People's Convention, not just from Western countries. In particular, he thought that Nehru, now Prime Minister of Independent India, should be involved. Nehru had spoken publicly about his support for the idea of a world federation, which he called One World, and he had recently met with American world federalist Edward Clark, and he'd also spoken enthusiastically about world federation on the University of Chicago radio. Bahar thought that Nehru could lead a group of newly emerging post-colonial countries to support world federation and to send delegates to the People's Convention. Usborne, who had himself been born in India and was well aware of Nehru's views on World Federation, heartily agreed, and he wrote to Nehru about the People's Convention idea. And Nehru was cautiously supportive. He'd read many of the Western proposals for world government, and he knew that some of them did not include the people of the colonies. He saw that Usborne and the World Movement for Federal World Government did include everyone, and so he replied positively although taking the opportunity to stress again the importance of including everyone and ensuring equality and justice. Or in his words, and I quote from the letter that he wrote to Usborne in 1948, I have little doubt that the great majority of our own people would welcome the idea of international cooperation or some kind of a world government, but it's important that they must not think of this as a reversion to European or any other domination. In 1948, the world movement held its second congress, this time in Luxembourg. Again, some 300 people attended, including several heavyweight figures, such as Lord William Beveridge, former director of the London School of Economics and designer of Britain's new welfare state, and Sir John Boyd Orr, the first director general of the Food and Agriculture Authority. By now, the movement had over 300,000 members. The Congress discussed the People's Convention and set up an international steering committee to coordinate the preparatory work. Just a few months earlier, American peace activist Gary Davis had publicly renounced his American citizenship while he was in Paris and declared himself a world citizen. He was drawing huge support across Europe with his message of world peace through world government and world citizenship. And he was starting a mass movement with thousands of people coming out in rallies 
and literally hundreds of thousands of people registering with his World Citizens Registry. Davis also supported the idea of a People's Convention, and his voice amplified the calls for it far and wide across Europe and beyond. However, by late 1948, tensions were beginning to flare up again between the Soviet Union and the European countries, and people began to fear that a Third World War may be about to erupt. Discussions in political circles moved away from the idea of a World Federation, at least in the immediate future, and instead turned to various kinds of Western alliances. British politicians debated the various options. Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan, previously cautiously supportive of the idea of a World Federation, now turned to the idea of a so-called Western Union, what would later become NATO. In opposition, Winston Churchill favoured unifying Europe, what would later become the European Union. Parliamentary support for Usborne's idea of a World Federation began to diminish. But nonetheless, Usborne and his colleagues continued preparing for the People's Congress. But by 1950, it was already too late. The Korean War, a proxy war between the US and the Soviet Union, had started, and the world was splitting into communist and capitalist blocs. People began to rally around nationalist causes, and even popular support for the idea of World Federation lost its fervour. While some 500 people from 42 countries did indeed attend the People's Convention in Geneva in December 1950, the convention was not a success. Usborne's system of electing delegates to the convention never found its way into practice, with the one exception of the American state of Tennessee, which did indeed hold formal elections for delegates to the People's Convention, and elected three representatives who did indeed turn up in Geneva ready to vote on a world constitution. However, they were the only elected delegates. Io Ita, a professor and politician from colonial Nigeria, also turned up and declared that he'd been elected by the various tribes and people of his region. But four people was not enough. The elected delegates looked over the draft world constitution that had been prepared by the Chicago Committee, and also another draft constitution that had been prepared by advocate Sanjib Chaudhari of Calcutta, India, who presented his text at the convention but there was little that they could really do. And instead, the six-day convention turned into a general talking shop about how a real people's convention could be organized, what should be in a world constitution, and so on. But by now the world had changed, and the plausibility of states ratifying a world constitution in the coming years now seemed remote. While some groups decided to keep on with the people's convention plan nevertheless, including the campaign for world government, and later the World Constitution and Parliament Association, most people now turned away from the idea. Usborne himself decided to change tactics, and the following year he set up the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government to bring together parliamentarians from many different countries to discuss how to reform the UN in the direction of a world government. And indeed, most of the world federalist organisations that continue to operate after 1950 changed direction to start focusing on reforming the UN. The promised Charter Revision Conference was still tentatively scheduled for 1955, and most of the energies of the world movement and its member organisations shifted now to thinking just how the Charter should be changed. In 1951, Usborne organised a conference of the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government to discuss the issue. 250 parliamentarians from 24 countries attended, and together they came up with a proposal to replace the General Assembly with a two-house system, a Council of States to represent states, and a Council of Peoples to represent the world's people, and to replace the Security Council with a World Executive Council, consisting of representatives elected from both the Council of States and the Council of People. They also proposed that the International Court of Justice would be given compulsory jurisdiction, turning it into a real world court that a UN police force should be formed, and that all states should go through a process of complete and simultaneous disarmament. This was essentially a minimalist approach that would create a very thin layer of federal world government that would deal with security issues. These ideas were very much in line with those of American lawyer Grenville Clark, who in 1950 had published his Plan for Peace, which was also built on the idea of UN Charter Revision. He later developed his ideas further with Harvard professor Louis Son, and together they published Peace Through Disarmament and Charter Revision in 1953, and then later in 1958, World Peace Through World Law. 
all these ideas flowed into the movement. And in 1953, the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government and the World Movement for Federal World Government held a joint congress in Copenhagen, and together they decided to focus on the UN reform plan. They adopted the plan of the parliamentarians and agreed to work to lobby their governments to support the plan when the Charter Review Conference would finally take place. The movement was again energised because they had a clear plan of action. In 1955, the 10th General Assembly of the UN agreed that there was indeed a need to review the Charter, and they nominated a commission which was charged with presenting a report to the General Assembly in 1957. The World Federalists stepped up their efforts to win support for their plan. But 1957 came and went, and still no Charter Review Conference was scheduled. The movement carried on in hope, because surely it would happen any year now. The discussions also began to broaden out. The world was changing. European empires were disintegrating, and colonies in Africa and Asia were becoming independent states. The world movement started to discuss decolonization and also issues of poverty and development. They proposed the establishment of a World Development Authority and a fund for economic development. At the Hague Congress in 1957, Komla Agbeli Gebedema, the finance minister of newly independent Ghana, was elected as the movement's president. Gebedema had been involved with the movement and also with the World Association of Parliamentarians for World Government since the early 1950s and he strongly supported the idea of UN reform. This marked the beginning of a short period in which the world movement began to diversify beyond its predominantly European and American membership and began to reach out to peoples in the newly emerging countries in Africa and Asia. As they began to think more broadly about world justice issues, and particularly about the colonial and post-colonial world order, many world federalists at this time thought that they would find allies and supporters in the newly emerging states in Africa and Asia, as these poorer and weaker states would have much to gain from a world order in which power politics would be subordinated to international law and in which greed would be subordinated to justice. And as these new countries joined the UN, they reasoned, they could form a third bloc, separate from the American bloc and the Soviet bloc, and they could have a real impact in shifting the UN in the direction of a democratic world government. A few months later, a regional congress was held in Kyoto, Japan. The Union of World Federal Government had been established in Japan in 1948, on the third anniversary of Hiroshima, and several of its members had been attending the World Movement's congresses since then. This regional congress focused almost entirely on the issues of ending colonialism, cooperation among the peoples of Africa and Asia, and economic development. Plans were laid to establish new World Federalist organisations in a range of countries, including Ghana, Senegal, Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Over the next few years, more and more delegates from African and Asian countries started to attend the World Movement's congresses. And the discussions focused increasingly on decolonisation and economic development, and the changes needed in the UN to bring this about. The 1961 Congress, held in Cologne, included delegates from Pakistan, India, Vietnam, Japan, Cameroon, Congo, Ivory Coast, Tunisia, Senegal, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Egypt, and several countries in Latin America. Leopold Senghor, president of the newly independent Senegal, attended and was elected as vice president. Japanese Nobel Prize winning physicist Hideki Yukawa was elected as president. The movement was changing. While the UN Charter Review Conference never, in fact, took place, in 1963 a small number of charter reforms were, in fact, agreed by the UN General Assembly. In order to accommodate the growing number of newly independent African and Asian states that were taking up their seats at the UN, the Security Council was expanded from 11 to 15 members, and the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, was expanded from 18 to 27 members. Whilst important, these changes were so small that to many it finally became clear that changing the UN Charter in any significant way was by now extremely unlikely. And thus the energy for UN reform began to run out. Many of the African and Asian delegates who had been attending the World Movement Congresses began to drop out. They saw more potential to affect change in the UN through direct political channels, such as the G77 or the Non-Aligned Movement, which united the developing countries to vote together as a bloc in the UN. And indeed, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, these movements developed an outline for a new international economic order, 
which sought to offer more opportunities to the developing countries and to even out the unfair existing international order. By then they formed a majority in the General Assembly and they managed to vote through their declaration. But then the real weaknesses of the UN system became clear because the rich countries simply ignored it. Most of the European and American world federalists also came to the realization that UN Charter reform was now unlikely. The youth and student division called for a shift in strategy. It was time to move away from the legalist approach of UN reform, they argued, and time to focus on more immediate world problems, such as securing human rights, improving east-west relations, working for international arms control, reshaping the world's economy and preserving the environment. And thus starting from the early 1970s, the movement again started to change and shifted to focus its efforts on issue-specific goals. They called their new policy Dynamics for Peace. In certain respects, their approach was broader than the UN reform approach. They wanted more of a maximalist approach, focusing on justice and not only on security. But they lacked a clear vision of how world federalism would deal with these issues, and indeed how world federalism would be brought about. And thus they fell into just trying to tinker with the existing international order to try to achieve some small improvements here and there. While this might have seemed more practical and realistic, it meant that the movement had basically lost its fundamental raison d'etre. Instead of talking about structural change to the world order, it just got bogged down in a whole variety of discussions about small improvements to specific issues. There were many other NGOs talking about how to make these types of small improvements, and the world federalists basically lost their identity and their core message. Numbers dwindled as members left the movement to pursue other avenues. But a small group continued on. Some were waiting for the political situation to change so that they could start again calling for world federation. And others were content to engage in countless discussions about world improvement projects. There were, of course, many activities, including the creation of the Institute of Global Policy as a think tank to advance education about global issues and world federation. But in all honesty, this was a low point for the movement. However, by the 1990s, the political situation did indeed start to change. In 1989, the Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War finally came to an end. The world was no longer divided into two separate blocks with two competing ideologies. Instead, all the countries were now taking part in the capitalist world economy. American political scientist Francis Fukuyama called it the end of history. In the coming years, it came to be known as globalization. Suddenly, it was indeed possible to imagine a unified world. Energy and enthusiasm began to return to the world movement. Furthermore, the 1980s had witnessed a major transformation of civil society. Many largely voluntary social movements had professionalized and transformed into NGOs, non-governmental organizations, with paid staff and offices and large grants from philanthropic or government donors. WFM decided to follow this route. In 1994, Bill Pace was hired as the executive director. A new office was established in New York, close to the UN. Grants were sought and a new strategic approach was agreed. WFM would now work with networks of other NGOs about specific issues with the aim of getting new institutions created at the global level, which would improve the governance of global issues. Pace had attended the Earth Summit in 1992 and he thought that global environmental governments would be the area where there would be most support for new institutions, in particular, turning the small and powerless UN environmental program into a proper UN environmental organization, which would be able to make and enforce international environmental law. But the leading environmental NGOs of the time were not interested. They were skeptical that international law would actually work. And so there wasn't a lot of support. But instead, Developments were starting in a different area altogether, that of international human rights law. In 1989, Trinidad and Tobago had proposed that the UN General Assembly should discuss the creation of an international criminal court to hold individuals accountable for the worst kinds of war crimes. The General Assembly had referred the issue to the Sixth Committee, the Legal Committee, and by 1994, a draft statute for a future international criminal court, or ICC, had been prepared and presented to the General Assembly. Even though there was strong opposition from larger states, such as the US and Russia, this looked like a process that was moving and that actually stood a chance. 
Pace started talking to other NGOs in the human rights and disarmament sectors, and found that many of them were also excited about these events. Amnesty International, in particular, were keen to rally support for the process. And so in February 1995, a meeting of around 25 interested NGOs was organised in New York, and the Coalition for the International Criminal Court was formed. PACE became the convener, and WFM hosted the small secretariat to organise the work. Over the next few years, there were several discussions at the UN General Assembly about the proposed ICC. There were states that supported, states that opposed, many arguments about how it should be composed, what powers it would have, and so on. The coalition attended these meetings and provided input and analysis. They also brought NGOs from the developing countries to participate so that they too could have a say. And they formed a partnership with the 70 or so states that supported the creation of the ICC. And as these activities started to bring results, more and more NGOs joined the coalition and the pressure on the states to create the ICC increased. In 1996, the UN General Assembly formally decided to hold a special treaty establishing conference in Rome in 1998. This is where the ICC would either finally be agreed or fall by the wayside. The coalition stepped up its activities, lobbying governments, providing analysis, proposing solutions to technical problems and keeping the pressure on. In 1998, the Rome conference took place. The fate of the ICC was still very much in the balance. The US, Russia and others were very much against it and they were doing everything they could to find a way to block it. But a large group of smaller countries were determinedly pushing ahead. The coalition, now consisting of over 800 NGOs, attended the Rome conference in force. While most states sent one or two delegates, and even the larger states sent 10 or 15, the coalition sent over 500 delegates. Their presence was huge. They set up a website and wrote daily updates so that people all around the world could know what was going on. If they saw a state beginning to back off from supporting the ICC, they would speak with their coalition members back in the capital city of that state and get them to talk to the ministers there. All this massively increased the transparency of the process and put pressure on the wavering states to stand by their previous positions. Eventually the treaty was passed and the Rome Statute to create the International Criminal Court was adopted. According to Bill Pace, who of course was there, there was a thunderous applause that went on for about 25 minutes. A partnership between a group of states and a group of NGOs had succeeded in creating a new international institution. An international court that would be able to investigate and prosecute individuals for four international crimes – genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the crime of aggression. This would be the first international court able to prosecute individuals, rather than states, and thus it represented a huge breakthrough in international law. In 2002, the Rome Statute entered into effect and the International Criminal Court was created. The coalition decided to continue working together and to support the fledgling ICC and to try and improve it. Over the next 20 or so years, Bill Pace and the WFM led the coalition, which during that time consisted of between 2,000 and 4,000 NGOs to work towards improving the International Criminal Court and keeping ordinary people aware of and involved in its activities. This formed the bulk of WFM's work during the past 20 years or so. The staff in the offices in New York and also in The Hague focused most of their energies on the coalition for the ICC. They also carried out some smaller projects, such as leading the NGO Working Group on the Security Council, which sought to improve the UN Security Council and make it more transparent. And they also contributed to thinking about the Responsibility to Protect initiative that was developing at the time. And while WFM became a well-known and well-respected NGO in New York, a disconnect began to develop between the NGO part of WFM and the movement part of it. All the member organisations continued to meet and discuss their ideas in the WFM Congress and continue to work in their own countries to promote World Federation. But they were only marginally involved in the activities of the NGO in New York. And since the early 2000s, there has been a great influx of new energy and a significant growth in these member organisations. In 2003, for example, the Committee for a Democratic UN was formed in Germany and joined the WFM. They set up the Campaign for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly and set about lobbying politicians and diplomats in order to win support. 
In 2013, the Spanish section of the campaign launched a lively global week of action for a world parliament. And in 2017, the Committee for a Democratic UN changed their name to Democracy Without Borders, and they began a process of expansion, setting up branches in India and Kenya, Greece, Spain, Sweden and Switzerland, with others on the way. And by now the campaign for a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly had gained considerable traction. It's been discussed in the European Parliament and various other international fora, and over 1,500 parliamentarians have given it their support. Democracy Without Borders has also started working together with other democracy-promoting NGOs to create a campaign for a World Citizens Initiative, similar to the European Citizens Initiative, in which ordinary people would be able to join together and get a particular issue discussed in the UN General Assembly. And in 2005, a new organisation was formed in Argentina, called Democracia Global, and they too joined the WFM. They started working with leading academics to issue a global democracy manifesto, and they've also created the Campaign for a Latin American Criminal Court, as a step towards building up more supranational institutions at the regional level. In 2013, One World was formed in Israel-Palestine, bringing together young Jews and Arabs to call for global democracy, and producing educational materials about global democracy and world federation. And in 2014, Professor Joseph Schwartzberg, Emeritus Professor at the University of Minnesota, set up the Workable World Trust to support activities focusing on UN reform and on global democracy more generally. And in 2019, the young world federalists burst onto the scene, bringing new youthful energy to the movement, engaging on internet platforms and social media, and rallying millennials and Generation Z to the cause of world federation. So as we can see, the world federalist movement has changed many times over the years responding to changes in world events by developing new ideas and new strategies. Right now is probably another inflection point for the movement. Bill Pace has retired, and the leadership for the Coalition for the International Criminal Court has been passed on to another NGO. There is a new leadership, a new energy, and a desire for new directions. In today's highly globalised world, it is now very much possible to imagine a unified world, a world federation, with global democracy and global citizenship. The problems with the existing international world order are becoming increasingly visible to everyone. A retreat to nationalism does not seem likely or desirable. So now, finally, it may be the right time for WFM to start again the push for world federation and global democracy.